Speaking of you listeners, um, we're fortunate today, we're in Madrid, uh, we're talking to a native of Madrid, a man, normally a right winger, but two-footed, naturally, you know we don't uh, speak to people who don't think about their talents in the big interview, but a man who won the title with Real Madrid here in La Liga, a man who won the title with Deportivo La Coruña, yes, you're getting hot already, you can begin to work out who it is, a man who was in the side from Deportivo La Coruña that won the Copa del Rey final in the Bernabeu against Madrid on their 100th birthday. Yeah, rude. Um, a man who went to the Champions League semi-final with Deportivo La Coruña and was part of the best team in that club's entire history. A man who won the Champions League with Real Madrid too. That means it's you, Victor Sanchez del Amo. First of all, what a pleasure to be in your native city, but Victor, when I say it's your native city, you, you were born, you were, you were brought up more in the part Getafe than, than mainly in Spain's capital. Is that right? And what was being, what did it feel like? What did it mean to you to be brought up in Getafe, a place that's now famous for their rather unusual football club? Yeah. First of all, let me, let me say thank you very much and my pleasure also. And for me, I'm very glad to be here joining this moment and this football talks with you and all your audience. Well, yes, now everybody knows about Getafe, thanks to football. But when I, when I was a child, uh, Getafe team that was in the, low, in the low divisions in Spain, so it was very difficult to, to know abroad, you know, out of Spain, somebody knows where is Getafe. You know? it's, a, it's a village uh, at the south of Madrid. Uh, where uh, humble people lives, uh, workers, no? they, they go to work to Madrid mainly, to the factories. Uh, and I was born there. And I started playing football there. In, in that times, uh, were the times that the kids, we spend all of our time, when we had time for, for play, playing at the streets. That, that, that's, that's one of the things that you and I share which made you a great footballer, a successful footballer, but it's a feature, didn't it? We've done like 135 interviews now. People that learned some of their skills, but also their mentality and their character, playing what we call street football, which, which doesn't always necessarily have to mean that it's in, in the street where the cars go. Sometimes it is, but you're playing on hard surfaces or muddy whatever. surfaces. Just, whatever. Yeah, wherever there was a space. Even sometimes we played with a ball. Sometimes we played with a ball. But not we always. we used to play with a bottle, with a, a glass. A, not always we had a ball to play football. That was the, the street football university you know, that, that built at that, at that time many, many smart players. I what, think. what does it teach you? A lot of things. A lot of things. Yeah, so, you know, you learn how to deal with uh, many issues that uh, come to football that is unpredictable. When you play a football game, uh, many things happen are unpredictable. When you play at the streets, when we play it, because nowadays that's not happening, happened many unpredictable things. So you have to deal with this. And in my opinion, this is very, very important. You play not always in a, in a regular space. There were cars, there were people, there were uh, gardeners, there were many, many things. No? So Did the police you had to come? Yeah, or sometimes you had to stop because a car was coming. So you, you kick the ball and you put the ball on a balcony and then you have to, to learn <laughs> another ability, social abilities, that you have to go to ask for the ball. The way you ask for the ball is the, the probability you get success coming it back or not. Not only uh, skills about playing football, uh, technical skills, also social abilities, leadership. You learn a lot of uh, leadership uh, skills from that football. First of all, we have to, to create the teams. Do you remember that days? Always there were two players that they were one, choosing one by one, creating the teams. They were leaders, captains. So the way they deal to, to, to prepare the teams, to choose the players, always they left the, the, the less skilled player for the end. But you could uh, see different behaviors 
in, in the kids at that moment, the one that they don't care about the, the skills and they say, okay, you are the last here, are the one that they, they was a little bit uh, taking care of the boy, okay, you come with us, but then let's see, you're going to play with us. So, it's not the same. You learned a lot from the street football. I'm really thankful to them. Of course, later I, I joined Real Madrid Football Academy that also made me as a football player in terms of the most of all winning mentality. And, and of course, a part of all the technical, tactical uh, lessons that you learn there. But the, the winning mentality for me that is something that makes the difference. But thanks also to the football school. The street school of football. What, what do you think, uh, as you go through your career, which will be a coach and sometimes a media analyst on football, and as I grow older and have to give up altogether, what do you think the effects we will all see because of the fact that now so few kids are playing in the way that, that you've explained? Things have changed dramatically. We all know why. It's not news that everybody has a gadget of some kind, yeah. that there's television stations everywhere. But when not so many players are experiencing what you've just described, over the next five or ten years, what will the effect be on football? I don't know. I have to be honest. I cannot uh, predict the future. But what is sure, I totally agree, that uh, we are in another era. We are in, in the digital revolution, and my generation, we have, uh, we have had the luck, or, or I think the luck, always you have to be positive, to, to live in the, in the turning point. So when we were young, there was no digital, there were uh, everything ana, ana, analog. analog. Also our, ourselves, so we were, our brain was our only software we have to deal, our brain. And our hardware, our main hardware, was our body. So that's why, as a, as a kid, we were playing every day. Not only football, tennis. I, I was a very good tennis player. I remember I was playing tennis when I was young, and I had to leave tennis because I joined Real Madrid Academy. And I was crying during a week every day because I was missing tennis a lot, because I, I, I love tennis. Uh, I've been one time at Wimbledon, and for me, this is one of the happiest days in my life. So that you can imagine how I like tennis. And the point was that we, we developed ourselves in, in this uh, analog uh, scenario. So by training ourselves, playing at the streets, moving, coordination, and our brain, uh, learning how to control our body and also our feelings, not only our movements, also our feelings. Uh, nowadays, everything has changed because digital era has bring a lot of information. So, and I think this is a very important point. Uh, we, the, the generation, we develop ourselves in, in analog scenario. We, we, we develop a, a great capacity for focus. Because there were no so many distractions like there are right now with the digital era that you have information for everything that you want in one second. So, that's a point in terms of performance, high performance, that is really, really important. The capacity that the, the sports uh, men, they have to concentrate in the task you are doing weekly by training and also in the competitions during the games. Not only in football, that affects to all sports. Uh, so that's uh, something we have to deal now. And mm, we tend, as humans, uh, as a coach I am now, and also as a father, we tend to use the, the, the things, the strategies, the tactics that they were good on us to, to learn, to reply in the new generations. But for me, this is a big mistake. That's why I always say, who helps the fathers? <laughs> because we are always thinking to help our kids, to help our players, young players, and etc. But who helps the players, who helps the coaches, uh, sorry, the, 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 par the parents, the coaches? because they are the, one, the teachers, they are the ones that they have to understand the new scenario, the new environment, to drive the, the best ways to teach the new generation. So 
I'm con really full concern with, with this because if we use the same techniques that they were used with us in the past, it's not successful. Some of them don't apply yeah, they anymore. Don't Some they of them are old-fashioned. And the, the matter of focus and the matter of concentration and the lack of attention is one of the most important points in terms of high performance because the new generations, they have so many stimulus, distractions. that they distractions, they distract them uh, every day, at any moment. So that's a good point to work on. When, when you were undistracted, and, and you were emerging, they, they call it, no, I mean, I, I sometimes break my rhythm. I described you as most, are you a winger? And you look back in your career, do you call yourself, I was a winger or not? Now, and, and what is a winger? <laughs> the win winner is that one, that when, when he lose, he's very quick learning and he has a, a big desire to face again the competition to have the chance to win because normally this kind of mentality are the ones that win more times there's no winners 100 percent there's no 100 percent winners i use again tennis comparison because i like a lot we have nowadays the big four Djokovic, Roger Federer, the, we are going to miss him a lot. Roger Federer, Rafa Nadal, Djokovic and Andy Murray. Okay, the big four. I'm so glad you named Andy, thank you. The big four. Okay, if you see the stats, the most they did was losing. But they won at the most important points. So they, they say that so we, this is, tennis is a game of losers because the thing that's happened more is you lose. You lose. You play so many games during your full career, not only in the good moments that you remember only, okay, the Grand Slam, big wins and all the ATPs. No, no, no. Come back to all the games you have played in all your career. The most you have done is to lose. So by learning from losses, you get lessons to make you stronger. And this is the spirit, I think, in the, that the, the winners they have. And you they want that? to learn. Yeah, of course, I was taught in that. I was made in Real Madrid Academy and also in, in, a, street, uh, in a street school. When we played at, at the street, it was uh, tough than a World Cup final. <laughs> for us, uh, for kids in our era, playing a game between the other neighborhood was like a Champions League final. So, and you don't know why. I think we were we 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 born with this uh, inside in our DNA. It's innate. Yes. Innate. 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 But later you have to develop because life, uh, since we was we, since we are born, the comfortable things come to to us. Especially from our parents, they give they gave us they give us, all to us. No, to try to avoid, okay, be careful with the kid, be careful with the baby, no, be careful, okay, we have to take care, of course, but also we have to train the, the people to, to be strong, to, to drive themselves without being directing all the time. I think this is very, very important, very, very important for the new generations. And this attitude that, that was in you, um, it, it helps you because it's not enough to have talent to be picked by La Fabrica, which is the way that people call um, it, the La Fabrica means the factory, but I suppose it's meant to mean the talent factory, although they never say La, uh, La Fabrica de Talentas. So when you get there, attitude as well as ability is really important. Can you describe, because you make your debut, I think, against Zaragoza yeah. uh, in the last game of a season, around, yeah. around yeah. about 95. Yeah. Yes, 95. 96 with Arsenio Iglesias. Uh, so Arsenio coach. is the coach who yeah. most people, we, we, so far we've had something like, I don't know, 25 million listens. And there are people from different generations. But I think I'm going to be one of the few who remembers Arsenio Iglesias. But it was a team very differently constructed. And I'm more, in, I'm more interested if you can paint a picture of what did Real Madrid as a club and an institution feel like then for you coming through? Because... You were thinking about how do I establish myself? How do I get in the team? How do I stay in the team? Who are my rivals? But also you're an intelligent man. You must have been looking around and thinking. And at that stage, 
Real Madrid had witnessed a Cruyff Barcelona winning consistently at home. It was a Real Madrid which wasn't winning in Europe. And I wonder what, what was the identity of the club when you were beginning to break yeah. through? Yeah. First of all, I, I want to also to add something about uh, the explanation of winning mentality. Because uh, we can also summarize in one, in, in one phrase. It's uh, the ability of quick learning. Uh -huh. For me, this is most important. One example, my son, that he loves football, and he's now 19, he's studying at, at Cambridge, he's a smart boy, he's a good boy. And he, he's also playing football at the university. You know? wow. he, he has been playing football since he was very young in, in many football, Spanish football academies, following, following my career as a player and also as a coach. But uh, not uh, now, uh, his main ability is his brain, no? but he's a sport man also and he's in general. But he asked me when he was very young, Daddy, what is the, the, the best skill that a football, player, a football player had? And I said to him, the quick learning ability. This is the best player, the one that learns faster than the others, because this is a continuous line of improvement. The, the day you stop learning is the day you stop uh, the, the end of your career is come to about, it's about to come, sorry. So, for me, quick learning is very, very important. And the, 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 the better players in the world are this, this kind. Mm -hmm. you know, even how much they have earned and how much they have won, they are in a continuing way to, to learn and to improve. For me, this is very important. And that's something that you learn also in, in Real Madrid, in Real Madrid Academy. And about learning, talking about learning, Without you know that, if you are stepping and, and scaling all the things in the youth system of Real Madrid like I did, when you reach the opportunity to make the jump to the first team, that is the big pressure because you have been playing football, okay? A, 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 a enormous competitiveness you have because the best players in Spain and many abroad are coming to the youth, uh, to the academy of Real Madrid. And you are passing, you are passing, you are passing, you are passing. But when you reach the, the moment to join the first team, it's the big pressure coming to you. But you have been taught in holding that pressure without nobody told you. What I mean? The first time you become Real Madrid player, you change as a normal boy. Because everything around you has an immediate change in terms of... Uh, expectations uh, and everybody is pointing at you everybody around you recognize you you are, you are not the, the single boy with your friends and your family no 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 you are the single boy not the single you are that one boy that is in Real Madrid system so first your family your friends at the school teachers you start to deal with this pressure this media pressure that is not pro media professional in terms of professional but in terms of expectation, that is the psychological way that is affecting to your capacity of performance, you are dealing. So, step by step, every time you reach a step further, the pressure becomes bigger. And when you join the first team, this is the biggest one. So, when I uh, was at that point to make my debut with Real Madrid, 95, 96, uh, that game at Zaragoza, the environment was really, really a pressure environment, high pressure because Real is used to win every season. But we came from some seasons in the first team of Real Madrid without wins. So you know the pressure that there is around. That What happened? Many changes of coaches and that was the chance I had to make my debut in the last day of that season, last match, Zaragoza, the team out of European competition and the team out of chances to get access to European competition, not even to fight for the title. Out of the six places that they, they drive teams to European competitions in the following season. So that made me to have the chance to make my debut and was a, a very uh, decaf debut for me because I had the winning mentality. I wasn't expecting to make my debut in this kind of situation. Like said, okay, I'm very thanks 
to Arsene Iglesias, that was the coach that came to try to find the solution during the season for the team, but he, he, he didn't succeed and was very tough season also for him, very difficult. And in the last game, many injured players, many players that they didn't want to go to play to Zaragoza and, and he uh, promote some players from the second team. I was in, in this, but he didn't even, he didn't know about that. So, but he gave me the, the chance to make my debut and I thanks a lot. But it was in the following season when Fabio Capello came to try to, to put order in, in that mess, <laughs> that was the, the moment I, I felt, I feel like my, my real debut. Of, of course, him. because one game is, is statistically your debut, yeah. but when you emerge, when you start to feel, I can, I can win my place, I, I'm part of things, sure. that's when you, your identity changes fully. But it's funny you, you said players who didn't want to go to play in Zaragoza, that under Arsenio it was a bit of a mess. The mess included Raul, Michel, Luis Milla, Sanchez, a legend of the club, Luis Enrique, before he decided to change allegiances, Ivan Samarano, Michael Laudrup, a guest on this interview series before, a fantastic footballer, Fernando Redondo played 23 times that season, people will have forgotten about Juan Esnaider, but a super forward, the late Freddy Rincon, Canizares was playing, Guti played nine times, what the hell was wrong? What? That's an incredible squad. Yeah, but Real Madrid always had top players. That's something that is, is very clear. But football is bigger than any club. <laughs> the game of football is the biggest team in the world. So nobody nice can phrase. be, no, nobody, nobody and no team can be more than football. So it's, it's a universe. Football is a universe. So there are so many options in football that Nobody can control football. If you look back now, this is a brief segment because we want, I want to hear about the successes and the glories. But if you look back at that era and the young eyes you had then, what was missing? Organisation, drive, hunger, better coaching? What, what was no, the absent it, element? We are talking about 90s, okay? But we have to understand also the, the Spanish football context during that decade. decade. Mm -hmm. So not only the 90s, uh, that was 96, 95 with Real Madrid uh, when I made my debut, but during the 80s, also during the 70s, Spanish football, it wasn't uh, uh, with the highlight that, uh, like now. So there were in other uh, countries, especially England, Italy and Germany, they were over Spanish football far away. What, what, that affects to the, to the teams in Spain. So the top players, they were playing abroad also. I remember Italy teams, uh, Germany teams, England teams. Th this was the yeah. golden area of Syria. A. Syria A was yeah, easily number one in the especially world. Especially Syria. So uh, that was the context for the fan, Sp Spanish football. And uh, there were something to be done to shorten that gap that the Spanish football they had with, uh, with other countries. And I think that thanks to Fabio Capello, Cam, it's not only Real Madrid made a, a big change in his history, a turning point. Also, it helps to Spanish football to shorten the gap with other, with other countries and start to be more competitive in international competitions. Well, let me be the narrator here to, to bridge the gap because one game against Zaragoza, Capello arrives, changes things for Madrid for Spanish football is your argument. And immediately, Victor, you play 36 times. 36 times in a title winning team. Um, he's there one season, you score five goals. There, there's not gigantic changes in the squad, but Mijatovic, Sedorf, Suker, all become very important, Panucci too. So I suppose there's some, some big transfer market work done that, that, that summer. Describe working for Capello and explain why the arrival of one man can transform a club, a squad, and in your argument, begin a transformation in La Liga too. Yeah, I, I, I think with the coach mentality I have now, the, the most difficult thing for a coach is to, to create the team atmosphere. 
So in big clubs, this is a big challenge because you have big players for sure, like we had in the previous seasons, the, the year I, I made my debut. But the, the, the big challenge is how to organize all this talent that you have around the same idea and around everybody working in the same direction. And not all, the most difficult is when the, the bad results come. Because when everything is okay, okay, everybody is happy to, to pull in the same, that, to, to, to push in the same direction. But the, when, when travels come, it's difficult. So this is the, one of the biggest challenges for a coach. That's why in, in Real Madrid history, we can remember big teams with big names. But it's very difficult to remember Real Madrid or whatever team you want to play, only about one player or players, no? Always a team that succeeds is a mix of players and team mentality, no? and team organization. So Capello brought that, definitely. Brought uh, a new method of work to Real Madrid, uh, high demanding mentality, daily. I, 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 the, the, the few things I learned all the time I was training with Real Madrid first squad during this period I was uh, about to make my debut, I, I realized that uh, there was a big difference between trainings and games. And I remember Fabio Capello arrives with one phrase that he repeat daily. We play as we train. So we train as we play. And every day he was repeating that. And I remember that he had to repeat a lot in the first days he was on the charge of the team. And with the pass of the days, he had to repeat less because the team understood the message. And all of us, we behave like he worked in. No? The trainings became like competition. It was amazing trainings in terms of uh, attitude, and performance, so that's a way to deal and to get used in the, in the, in the high demanding competition. But much more things, much more things. So I, I, for me, for me, uh, was a turning point in terms of tactics. So uh, also there has been a big change in football with the, with the te new technology that has come, uh, big data, artificial intelligence, uh, the, the, all the systems that there, there are to measure everything that happened in a pitch, not only in a game, also training, GPS, all the software. Full pitch videos so you can watch the whole game. The full analysis, that, that's the point I want to, to reach. Uh, I've never at that point used to see any single game with any coach, uh, any analysis of uh, our opponents. With Fabio Capello, he brought also the opponent's analysis. And there was not these uh, digital tools. There was also video, tape, and by, by playing, forward, rewind, okay, stop, play, look, here, there is the space, okay, forward, okay, stop, here, this is the problem, this is the space we have to attack, okay, this is, like that, I, I learned a lot in terms of tactic. But there, were, there was not the tools that there is now that you make, you should go to any, any football staff and it's amazing the, the preparations that they It's create. like NASA, it's like yeah, a space it's organization. Amazing. And the players are always sitting <laughs> and they only have to open the mouth and eat. No, but at that days, we have to be open eyes, open ears, open everything to learn. No? And the quickest learning are where the quickest improving. So I learned a lot. Uh, with Fabio Capello in terms of tactics or so, and I think he helps to tell, the team a lot. Tell me what position you played, because I, I would say in Spanish that you would normally be called an extremo. Yes. Um, were you an extremo? Yeah, and, and, and define what that is. And w if you were, what does Fabio Capello expect, not just of Victor Sánchez del Amo, but of his extremo, of his winger yeah. in, in, in that team? Okay, I was born in a football where the formation 1-4-4-2 was the usual. And at the times that the, the, most of the team, they play with two strikers. Yes. Classical strikers. Yes. So that affects to the, the skills, the ability and the way of playing of the teams and also of the players. And as a, as a winger I was, I start playing as a forward, so that's why I had a good skill in terms of finishing and I score always in all the, all the seasons I play for football, I, I always score some goals. But uh, as a winger, 
I develop my, my ability with my both legs to have the possibility to play both wings, but the most of the times I play as a right winger. It's not the same like now that the extremos they are, because they have been a change. Now the most usual formation is the 1-4-3-3, and we lost the two classical strikers for one and sometimes because many of the times they don't have classical striker and they have another kind of striker and they have moved the strikers to the wings and they play as extremos but with a, a, a responsibility more in attack than more in defense no? in our days, in my days of football in the 1-4-4-2 wingers we had to deal with offensive and with defensive and we had to reach the byline to make accuracy crosses and we have to reach our byline to help our fullback and our team to defend. So it's a long run uh, every, every game to cover. No? Nowadays, the streams, I don't see the streams now reaching the... The wingers don't no, do no, so no. much work. No. That's no. now the work of what they call here carrileros. Yeah. And in English we call wingbacks. Yeah. So Capello would often ask the two wide men in his four midfield to be helping the fullback and playing double cover if there was a wide attacker from the opponent. Yeah, but, but also, also Capello brought one idea that I think nowadays everybody understands. If you want to perform in a high level, football has two sides. When you have the ball and when you don't have the ball. All times, all football, things that they were uh, amazing on the ball, they could have a lack of uh, ability, focus. defense. Yeah. That yeah. was not a problem to get results. But there was a turning point about that with the modern football. Uh, if you want to perform in high level, you need to, to be a strong and you, you need to give a high performance in the both sides when you have the ball and when you have the ball. So Capello brought that to Real Madrid because it was a team that was used because of the quality of the players to be very good on the ball, but lack of the ball. And this, that was one of the biggest concerns with the team. Okay, with the ball, very important, but without the ball. And he made all the players, all these uh, big star players, they uh, commit with the defensive tasks. And then we, we were a team that everybody was saying about that, the big difference in Real Madrid, that we work as a unit on the ball and off the ball. So we were a very compact team and we were top team in terms of quality, but also in terms of uh, on quality you see through the ball. Mm -hmm. But when we, don't, when we didn't have the ball, it was an aggressive team, high pressure team, compact team when we were sitting back. So very difficult to create chances to us. So we, he balanced the, the mentality between offensive task, defensive task, and then we made the step to to perform higher. And, and anything, all these things led Real Madrid and also Spanish football, because what Real Madrid, what biggest club do in a country, Real Madrid, Barcelona, in Spain, the main, uh, all the other teams they copy mm -hmm. and they follow the line. Yeah. So I, that's why I said what's not so only very important for Real Madrid history, also for the Spanish football history, because all the teams, they start to shorten the gap with uh, abroad teams. I was lucky enough in, in that championship season to visit the training ground because in those days, if you were a journalist, you could come to the training ground, you could watch training. And one day, uh, it was Roberto Carlos's birthday, I think, and Capello said, OK, training is over, that's fine, everybody in. But Roberto Carlos stayed out with six <laughs> or seven footballs, trying to bet, there was, because the old training ground was much more, it was not so high tech, and there was a little gardener shed, a garage where the tractors were kept and he would stand about 30 metres away and try to yeah. bend the football yeah. into the little garage and Capello said once, vamos Roberto, por favor, and Roberto Carlos just yeah, yeah, paid yeah. no attention whatsoever and in the end, and it was on your Capello and oh, fuck what? Okay. and he walked away and left him because Roberto Carlos was Roberto Carlos. What kind of football is that? Street football. It's street football. <laughs> 100%. It was so funny 100%. to watch. And it, but but it, it, it told me a story that Capello is a disciplinarian. Yeah. He wants things just this way. If you cross him, then you'll have some trouble. But also he gives some elasticity to the great players. Yes. When they don't come in, when he says, now come in, he's like... Of okay. course, I, 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 he knew uh, which player deserves 
one way of behavior with him and which other players with another. He That's true of Capello, strategy. yes? Yeah. That... yeah, of course, but I think this is 100% right. Because uh, as a coach, as a manager, I have a lot of influence from Fabio Capello, for sure, ah. in my, my mentality as a coach. But I, I repeat this to my players many times. I cannot treat every one of you the same. But I demand the same responsibility for every one of you, the same. Nice. The same. Nice. It's not the same, the responsibility and the respect. It's not the same. You don't have to, to confuse with the way we treat. Because you have one brother and one sister, and you don't treat the same, your brother and your sister. So it's very used from players, but as a player, we, we are used to give excuses for everything. Always excuses for everything and always complaining. As a player, I don't know when in football history they touch the players to complain for everything. But I did as a player when I was as a player and when I became coach, I understood this and I said, okay, if I, now I learn coach side, I had, I, had, I had had to learn this before because I, I, I would have before a, a better behavior many, many times. What did in you case of complaining. What did sure. you complain about? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> you complain, you reach the training, oh, today is raining, what a boring day to train. You come the following day with the sun, ah, today is sunny, Phew. <laughs> this is too hot. So and you're never okay with the things. Now this is more or less this the is general. Football. Yeah, but this is football. But later you switch on, and then you connect to the to the task. Yeah, this yeah. is very important. But this is very nice also and funny for coaches to deal against the uh, complaints mood that the players they had the most of the times. It was a season. And Capello, we were talking about Capello, and Capello was a master with that. Capello was a master because he knew how to treat different ones, okay, the leaders, the big players, Raul. Raul was 19 years old. Yes. 19 years old, but he was sitting on the, on the table with the, with the captains and with the top players. And Capello was treating Raul the same like Miyatobis because he was the, one of the most important players for the team, Fernando Hierro captain, Manolo Sanchez was a player that he was playing at the first 11 as a first choice the most of the time, but was an important player in the dressing room and Capello knew that and he gave his place also. So mm, he behaved like that, but later with the, with the other players, he had different treatment and, and the things that led to the, to the stars, uh, he didn't let to, to the others, but we understood. We understood every one of us. At that stage, you, you were the others. At that stage, you yeah. were part of the yeah. others. You can imagine you, that the young, the young players from the youth system, we were in the, in the lowest uh, step. <laughs> the lowest rung. Yeah. Everybody, all of you will know um, about Raul more or less. But Victor just mentioned that he was about 19. It was a second season, he was breaking through. 42 matches, 41 starts, 21 goals for Real Madrid under Capello in a title-winning season. He's been ignored a little bit, but an astonishing footballer. He wasn't, he's a huge, strong character, but at that stage probably he wasn't one of the bosses of the, the, the dressing room, the training ground, the, the restaurant, the bus journeys. But... But who was? I'm guessing that even though he was relatively new at the club, Yero already was somebody who wanted to be a boss. You've mentioned Sanchez. Sedorf always thought he yeah. was right about everything all the time. One of our guests was Sven Joran Eriksson, who coached him at Sampdoria. And Sven gave us 15 minutes of how he had to re-educate Sedorf about, why do I have to work? Just give me the ball and I'll do special things. Who have we not spoken And you can see nowadays he, how he is fit. He keeps fit now, he's in the same age like me. We are very good friends. We, we were teammates when he reached Real Madrid. He could I still can... play. He could still yeah. play world-class football. Yeah, so how, how... It's ridiculous. How it changed the mentality of a player, because we are, we are kids. We are kids, but we are kids that we want to learn. If you want to learn, you improve much yeah, yeah. than others. This is the, the big point. And, the, 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 fit capa the, the fitness capacity is something nowadays also is a high demanding for, for every player. In, in that group, who was the big boss in the players? Who, who, who was the... Look, this is a difficult for me to choose because, okay, the Real Madrid dressing room, always there is the, the low, I think it's a football low, the, 
the most experienced players are captains. So, respecting that, that always happening, and at that moment was Manuel Sanchez, Fernando Hierro, and Paco Bullo. The keeper, the goalkeeper. But you know what happened? This is the turning points in, in, in all the clubs where legends, players are about to finish their career, and then new generation is coming, pushing, and some coach has to deal with that and has to make the change also in the leaders in the dressing room. Capello did, okay? Fernando Hierro was the, the top player at that moment, but he kept Manuel Sanchez and Paco Bullo as a captains without a role of first 11 players, but Raul jumped there straight. Ja Raul jumped I, I know Raul since 14. We were teammates. He, he joined Real Madrid at the age of 14. I, I'm sure that you know, but I'm going to explain you. He was Atletico de Madrid academy player. And at that days, uh, the president of Atletico de Madrid decided to, to cancel the Jesus the Hill. System. The famous the Jesus, famous Hill. Jesus Hill. And he canceled them, the most of the team in the just system. So a lot of boys, a lot of young players, they, from one day to the other, they were without a team. And Real Madrid picked Raúl. He came to our team, we, we were in the under 15, and he was, he was under 14. That was very unusual for Real Madrid system, where they were very strict with the age of the players. So if you are in the under 14, you are under 14. If you are in under 15, you are under 15. But they, they promote Raúl because he was outstanding in Atletico Madrid as a, as a big talent scoring. Just that, scoring. He, every game he played at Real Madrid, he scores many, many goals. But at the age, you know, 11, 12, 13, okay, you, you are standing out, but it's a long way to become a professional football player. But there was a luck, a lucky moment for Real Madrid because Raúl was free and he came to Real Madrid and they promote one young older players he was playing with us. And from the first day, you could understand that he had a natural talent to score. He was a lefty, very thin <laughs> player, very thin player, no fitness condition, but with a inside power that you, you, could, you couldn't understand how so much powerful boy in a, in a very thick uh, body. So it was amazing. And, uh, he, he jumped like a rocket. Did, did you ever yeah, get we were... uh, as an extremo? And Raul always played as a forward, but in my mind, is he an outright nine? You know, no. Yes, no. The, the classical uh, formation for Real Madrid was influenced for mm, the big success team that we had, La Quinta del Buitre, yeah. Real Madrid. And there was nine, a number nine, a striker, Hugo Sánchez. And a second forward, like was Emilio Butragueño, not like a classical number, number nine, but a forward. Okay, the ability to play between lines, to move uh, smart movements to the spaces, quality to play with his back to the a, goal. A, a nine and, and a half, you could yeah, say now, yeah, yeah. more or less. Yes, like, a, like yes, a nine and a half, number ten, number ten, with good skills also in terms of scoring. Raúl was a number nine, in a body of a number ten, but he was a number nine. Definitely, because you put the ball on the box, you cross from the wing to the box, and Raúl had the, the ability to find the, the best position to take the ball wherever, with the head, with the right, with the, he was lefty, mm -hmm. but he scored so many goals mm -hmm. with the right. We said, but that player is lefty. Mm -hmm. How can he score this such a great goal with his right, from outside of the door, from inside, whatever. He could score for every place. So he made a, a, a big jump to the first team when, when he was 17. I played with him together under, five, under 15, under 16, under 17. But when he was 17 years old, we were in the 13 of Real Madrid. And then uh, Jorge Valdano took him to the first team. Jorge Valdano, when he reached to Real Madrid, he did something really, really good. Also linked to Vicente del Bosque that he was um, academy director. Head of the academy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They built a, a, a most talent players in the system, a group with the most talent players in the youth system since uh, 16 years old, since 18. And they, they made extra trainings, that was something that never done in, in Real Madrid, uh, with the first team staff. So Fabio, uh, Jorge Valdano was training this group of talent 
every afternoon. So he did yeah. his first team training, yeah. so, but then he yeah. worked with yeah. the younger group yeah. in the and, afternoon. And they were doing a very good work for this uh, group of talent players in, in, to help them to approach the professionalism. Wow. Really, really important. And I'm very, I'm very, thank you to, very thanks to him also, to Jorge Valdano, because he was very important in, in my career and of course in Raul's career. In all this talent, uh, group talent, uh, we reached the first team uh, a, a good number of players. Raul, uh, Álvaro, Guti, García Calvo, and, and me, five. We were a, a generation. And you probably reached it a little more quickly than you would have done, but also better prepared. Yeah, for sure. Also, they, they started to use us in trainings with the first team. Ah. They started to use us in, in friendly games that the first team they had at that time where there was not this mess of calendar with games, uh, official games every day. So, <laughs> so it was very helpful for us also. We learned a lot. So far, we've talked a lot about ideas and strategy and your abilities, your vocabulary as a coach is really emerging really strongly. But I want to stop, I hope, and allow you to enjoy some endorphins because you're a human being, not just a footballer or a coach. You win the league in your first big season after years of the dream team winning, etc., etc., And Aleti winning the double in 95-96. What, what, what was the feeling for a young man from the Fabrica how did your family feel? How did your friends feel? I suppose when you win the title, and one of the clinching games is a derby, beating Atletico late on, you beat a very interesting bus on a side with Ronaldo, with uh, Figo, with Bobby Robson, etc. But was it magnificent to, to go back to your parents, to, to speak to friends from school as a champion of Spain? What was the sensation? Yeah, look, we are talking about emotions now yeah and sorry I, I know of course and I thank you a lot because for me this is a very important point we have to understand that uh, as a humans we have to deal with two sides every day the cognitive and the emotional the reason and the emotions we cannot uh, uh, close one side and focus just in the other. We have to learn to deal with both. So it's very important. And, and the most of the uh, and our, our performance depends on the two sides, it's how to deal with the two sides. So I was taught in Real Madrid Academy, I don't know why, but to learn to deal with the emotional side, to control it, I don't say control, no. how to deal with it in the, in the peak moments to focus in the task and to avoid that the emotions affects to you. That's the point, because you never can control the emotions. You deal with them, but you don't control. You have to deal and to, to understand how to behave, to balance, to find the balance. So this is the point. The big change in your life is when you became famous in terms of football player, and especially when you became famous with the highlight that there is Real Madrid. So I remember that, that was like, oof, wow. Yesterday I was going with my girlfriend to a restaurant and I was eating a burger, comfortable. Nobody was looking at me. But from one day to the other, I couldn't do that because I felt all the sides looking at me, how I was eating my burger, with my fingers dirty, okay, like like everyone, but that's affects to you, and this is emotional yeah. side, no? This yeah. is the 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 things that come from something that is professional, no? Your your job. But I don't know why, but you learn. I was taught to focus there and to unfocus the other side. So what I want to mean? Suddenly I was playing every weekend with Fabio Capello in Real Madrid, first team, facing Barca, one of the best Barca in history, facing Atletico Madrid, etc., big clubs, and winning La Liga. And also, start, I started at that moment going with the national team, under 21, and we won La Liga, and in a couple of years, 
also we won, we became European, European, Champions. European Champions League with the national team and also we won the Champions League the following season. The under-21 so European Championship. I, I, I used the two years I played for Real Madrid in the, in the first squad. That was like, come on, it, it's happened so quick. Okay, for sure this is, this is a, a dream become truth uh, at some moments, but you were touching, focusing the trainings, focusing the games, and you were focused there. You were at home with your family, with your friends. Oh, very nice, good game. You are doing great. Okay, yes, yes, thank you. Okay, but you don't stop there in the feelings through the emotions, and you were focused how to learn more, how to improve, because the high demanding, demanding environment where you are in Real Madrid doesn't let you a moment to stop and think about what you have done because maybe it could be too late for the next step. And there are many examples nowadays. There are players that we can use an examples that maybe is happening with them like that. Okay, I'm thinking what I did. I'm thinking what I did. I did this, I did this. But what are you doing now? This is the problem in Real Madrid. It's not what you did. It's what you do. What you do when you use this T-shirt is what you do. It's not what you did. You are defending what everybody did before. You won and the others. But if you don't defend well in the present, you don't deserve to put the t-shirt in the next game. That was the mentality I had. So I fought every game to be able to use again the t-shirt in the following way. So there was few space in my, in, my, in my head for feelings. Just feelings about pressure, handle the pressure, and improving and continue prison. More in a professional way, than an emotional way. I always said, when I retire, I will have time to look back, make a review, and enjoy. Like today. Like today, for example. But you're talking about a really clinical mentality about fight for the shirt, perform, don't relax, don't get complacent, fight, work. Those are, everything you've explained now, explain why you won the title, why you won the Champions League at that club. But it's also, the things you've talked about are very addictive. We become addicted to, don't talk to me about feelings, I haven't got time for yeah. you. It's a very addictive thing to get yes. on this habits. hamster wheel. And your habits. Habits. You, by living in the same way during many years, you get your habits. So, and, and we repeat. So make sure they're good ones. Yeah. The, the following year, before we start to talk about Deportivo La Coruña, which we must do, is there any way you can sum up, explain for people around the world, especially given the, the Septima when it comes, the European Cup, Madrid have owned the trophy, they invented the, the, the tournament, more or less. They've owned it under Gento and Puskas and yeah. Di Stefano. And the 60s belong to Real Madrid. The yeah, yeahs, the Beatles, the, the, the 60s are really the Beatles and Real Madrid, <laughs> and that's it. Maybe Sinatra. And then Madrid can't win it, just can't win it for nearly 30 years. Do you remember, football is bigger than anyone. <laughs> football will, if you think you're bigger than football, it will, it will slap you down, and, and maybe it does for Madrid. Heinkes is the coach. You can explain to us a little bit what he was like because he has an unfortunate season. I remember going to the press conference in the hotel in Amsterdam uh, before the Champions League final against Juventus. You've scored on, on the route to the final against the Olympiacos. You play in Dortmund where the pressure is, hold on. I think the 1-0 advantage from the first leg, the, the pressure is, hold yeah. on, don't yeah. concede. It's 0-0, you're in the final. And I remember because Heinkes couldn't win the league and the league form wasn't strong, there was a journalist said to him, yup, yup, if you win the Champions League tomorrow, will it save your job? And he was like, yeah. no. Yeah. He said it, he knew it, he was out, and he still had a Champions yeah. League to win. But the Septima is bigger even than the strange story of Jupp Heinkes. For Madrid, how did it feel that this, this demand, win the Septima, win this season, and when it happened, why did it happen? For me, what, what Jupp Heikens did at Real Madrid was unbelievable. Because he, he reached the team in a very difficult environment. You know, since many years, you are struggling uh, down to Barca, and then, one coach came, like Fabio Capello, 
and turned that. And suddenly he left. He left. Why? So, why Capello had to leave Real Madrid after succeeding? After succeeding? Why? I don't know. But, for sure, it's something that is strange. It's something at the back of the scenes happening. And then they brought Heikes. So, the things that were happening at the back of the scenes, I guess, had to deal with that. Not only what was happening at the pitch. So, I think there is something there. I don't know, but... <laughs> Madrid is a very political very, club. Yeah, yeah. And remember that... Uh, and I remember when I made my debut, uh, the president of Real Madrid was Mendoza. Ah, Ramon Mendoza. Course. Yeah. But a uh, short time, because then there was the change with Lorenzo Sanz. But in, two, in three, four years, Florentino Pérez came. But we know the, 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 the moment he came. But we don't know the moment he started to work to try to reach Real Madrid. So I think that was happening at that moment. Behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. So it was a very difficult situation for Hakens because then also we go to the sportive uh, side only. You have the players used to train in one way, succeed way with Fabio Capello, and then you are a coach that you come and you have to continue. But the players, you continue, but Heikes also was a, a very good coach with high CV also, and he tried to do his, his style. So, so his style was a bit different than Capello's one. And what happened with this? That some players, they don't, because we came from a succeed way to work to another different way to work, but if you are going to succeed or not, you are going to see at the end of the season. But during the way, some players, they didn't like a lot the way we were training, the differences between him and Capello, and he started to lose some players in the, in the dressing room during the season. What happened also, that with this environment that was not full focus in mm -hmm. the game and in the work, because they had, some players, they had the doubts, the performance is not consistent. Well, is it easy to summarize what the differences were? It's, it's not about what are the differences, because for me this is not the important thing. Every one of us, we are different and we behave in a different way, but we can reach the same point in terms of performance with, from, uh, with different ways. The point is that the players, as I said to you before, uh, we are used to be, uh, how to say, uh, always, always comfortable and always complaining and we don't like to change. The mentality, we, have, we are fair to change, and, 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 and I changed my mentality suddenly because I understood that by changing you improve a lot. But many players, no, no, we, and it's something that is setting. Let's football. stay like, it's we good, to still let's do, stay like this. We have to do this because it was good uh, last season. Okay, and why we cannot improve by trying something different, no? But this debate was happening in the dressing room. It's not the, the things. It's, the, it's about the mentality, and the mentality brings doubts. I understand. And with doubts, you reduce your capacity of performance. For me, the confidence, the trust, is, the, is like the oil in an in engine. And as a coach, is, you have to, to work on that. I have my own methodology to develop trust environments in, in the dressing room. It's something you cannot leave for a lucky or for something. Just by chance, you, you, need, apart. you need a strategy. And you need to work on that because trust, environment, team, confidence is really important and individuals also. You have to work on the two different sides of the trust. And at that moment, the, the environment in the team, the dressing room, lost trust. But, but Victor, I, I, you've lived this and, and over our interviews in my career, I'm, I'm pretending to be shocked because I know that football does this. If you don't mind the language, how the fuck? Do Real Madrid end a 30-year wait for their beloved trophy, yeah. which always gets out of their hand at a time when the, the trust in the dressing room isn't good, yeah. one or two players have lost their way, so, the coach is about to be sacked, and yet, in the worst possible circumstances, the most difficult thing happens. Yeah, and then you can understand how I, I, I give the credit to Duke Huggins reaching that achievement 
in such a difficult environment for him because he didn't have the, the full, uh, uh, how do you say, the full holding from the board of directors because, you know, the connections between important players and board of directors, if the they, player they has some doubts, the yeah, they, they say, hey, we have this doubt, and then the board of directors, they had the doubts, and finally, we're struggling in La Liga, we, we end out of uh, European competitions in that uh, season, that is amazing also, back to the, ba back to the past, I think we, we finished seven out of European places, but in Champions League, the team changed the mentality. Why? Because always that team uh, had a winning mentality, thanks also to Fabio Capello a lot, and was a hunger team. And okay, we said, mm, there is a chance in, to turn history also. 32 years without winning the Champions League for Real Madrid. Mm, it's a good time to win, no? Mm -hmm. We are going to become like uh, heroes, no? For, for Real Madrid history. And, and that dressing room, that players, they had this, this hunger. So we, we played with another mentality. And, and I remember uh, all the games in the, in the group, we played well, okay, especially when you have a, a low team in the, as, a, as an opponent, you lower a little bit the, le the level, you know, that happened always with the big clash, but when we reach, Semifinals against Borussia Dortmund, that they were champions of previous season, we passed with a very good performance. And against Juventus in the final, that also they were favorites, great Juventus, Zidane, Del Piero, amazing club. Since the previous day, since the last training before the, the final, I knew we were going to win. <laughs> there were two, two points, I realized that because we did a special camp for the final. You, you went yeah. several days in advance? Yes. Yeah. And, and to a forest? To Amsterdam. Or? Not to Amsterdam. We you, you didn't Amsterdam. stay far away from... Far away from the city. Yeah. No, but not so far away. Closer village. But, you know, Holland, small village, camp, good. I think uh, five, four days that they camp there before the, the final. And... The players commit also, I, I, I realize also, the, the players, the, the big players, the captains, the, the most important players, they, they made meetings to commit, okay, this is our chance. Hunger players, hunger players. All of us, we realize that we were in a historic opportunity for our careers. And also, from a staff uh, side, from Jupp Heikens, uh, he did something that was my, the first time as a player, I, I, I saw, and I can tell you my, my experience, it affects to my motivation for the game. I, we, we were talking about before that there, was, there wasn't the times where the staff, they prepare football, uh, match preparations with videos, analysis in, in the screens, uh, slides, uh, a lot of information, everything prepared no, to anticipate the game. That weren't the, that moment. He prepared a, a video uh, high, with the highlights of all the players. First time. Your players? Our players. So he, he, you said, okay, boys, today, before coming to the dinner, we are going to watch one video. And then we, he drove us to the video room and he uh, pushed the play. And we were waiting some analysis from the opponents or something like that. Because, yeah, something for some preparation, some insight, something. Or, or maybe we are going to watch some video from, from Juventus and start to, to, to see, we started to see our own movements and plays, highlights from all, not only from the stars of the team, all the players had their space in that video with goals, with passes, with uh, strong actions, defensive actions, succeeding, very positive. Now, now, is, now is, this is very typical. All the coaches and all the staff, they use the video motivation. But not that. Players, but not that. And for me, it was something amazing. And I remember that we had the following day, the last training. And I remember that training as the best train I have been in my life. So the level of performance of all the players that day was amazing. We finished the, the training with the typical game, uh, not five aside, aside, no, because we were all the squad, so we played 
not 11 against 11, maybe it was 12 against 12 in half pitch, but it was amazing. Every player that touched the ball was doing their best. Uh, so mm, I said at that moment, mm, I think that Juventus is, the, they said Juventus is the favorite, but like this, we kill everyone. And the other point was when we were uh, just about to come to the pitch, uh, you know, the, the two lines of players in, in the dressing rooms, the first time you, f you see the face of your opponents. Because during, you are in the dressing room, you don't see them. During the warm-up, you focus just in your side, you don't look to their opponents. But when you are going to the pitch to the start, <laughs> In the uh, pasillo, como in the corridor. In, in the, the corridor, in the corridor, you have to face them because you are one meter dif distance, and then you see the eyes, <laughs> and the eyes, there wasn't our eyes. So you see, when when you see in your face, you trust the confidence, the self confidence, this power you see in the side, and and we realize ourselves we were stronger than them. Piel de gallina, <laughs> goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you right now, and my, my spine is tingling. I, you took us there. And, and of course, maybe some of that was nerves because they were their, their defeat to Dortmund the year before 3 1, I think in Munich, was a massive disaster for them, entre comillas. I, I spent time with Lippi um, in Juventus, uh, watching training three, four days with his fitness coach Ventroni, and he kept speaking again and again about how because of the disaster at Heysel, Juventus needed to, to win a Champions League yeah. without any problems or any yeah. stain or anything. And it was almost as much of an obsession for them as it, as it was for Madrid. But that night, I love the idea that you could see that you were on a, on a bigger level of belief and motivation from them. It's beautiful. They, they, they chosen the wrong opponent and the wrong day. <laughs> life, life can be like that. Victor, it's such a shame to move to, uh, away from Madrid so quickly, but because I, I want to speak to you about the classical and I want to speak to you about your ideas about coaching, there's an idea of, of, that you've shared. I'd love to speak to you about the, the biggest phenomenon right this week in world football, which is Erling Haaland. But we have to stop and, and try to explain both to those who enjoyed it and those who don't quite remember it. Deportivo La Coruña, I'm an Aberdeen fan. We're a coastal town, a fishing town, a small town of 200,000 people. We won two European trophies. Therefore, I feel really inspired by, attracted to Deportivo La Coruña. You go there after Racing Santander. What are the elements? The president, the coach, Irureta, who isn't talked about enough, the great players you play with. What are the elements that allow Deportivo La Coruña to win the title, the Spanish title? A Spanish title where you beat Madrid 5-2, you beat Athletic home and away, you beat Barcelona, you beat Sevilla, you beat Valencia. You win the title, you win the Super Cup, eventually you'll win the Cup in Madrid's own territory on, in the Bernabeu on their 100th birthday. You go to a Champions League semi-final. Let's try in your memory or your analysis to, to, to explain the beauty of that project. Yeah, that's amazing. And really thanks to football because I, I, I have uh, experience in my, in my life the 360 degrees options that football provides to you. I, I've been in, in the biggest club in the world for me, Real Madrid, in the youth system former player and reaching the first team that this is an experience, something that you never remember, you never forget. Succeed in the first team, but later the football have another phases. And I moved to Racing de Santander one year, a loading uh, profile. I, I was at the half season top scorer leader. That's amazing. I re remember in my, my start as a player when I was young as a, as a forward, I was playing Racing Santander as a, as a forward. And I, and I was in Christmas days with my family at home uh, taking the, the grapes, you know, the, 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 the yeah. grapes at the, yeah. at the 12 o'clock bells as, of, of as New a Year. As a pichichi of La Liga. Oh, nice. You can imagine. That's a good memory. That's a good memory for not a special the, forward. The grapes tasted sweet that yeah. year. Yeah, okay, half time, no, not <laughs> at the finish, but half time, okay, it's okay. Anyway, so I, I, I learned 
this other football in a, in a humble uh, team uh, struggling just the, the, the target and the objective is to stay in the first division but from there also I had chances to go because I was outstanding as a, as a scoring player I had the possibility to go to national team and also to promote to move to Deportivo La Coruña that Deportivo La Coruña the, is this kind of thing that suddenly appears in football from the youth system, not from the youth system, from the youth level, youth, no, low level, sorry. They, they were struggling in the third division of Spain for many, many years. But the small city, the northwest, rainy, windy, but very nice people, for sure, I tell you. I spent later 10 years of my life in, professional and, and not professional as a retired so my son was born in La Coruña so I, I have a piece of La Coruña in my heart for sure <laughs> and, and at that point the president I think is one of the the most important things that happened for Deportivo La Coruña Augusto Lendoiro there was a time in, in Spanish football where uh, there, there was a fight between the, the TV operators trying to get the monopoly, no? there were different ones. So the, the teams, they were uh, negotiating by themselves, okay, I'm with this platform, i with this other. So there was a moment to, that the business around football, the, business, the, the, the football industry was in the way to build the good uh, structure to develop business football. No? And Lendoiro was very smart at that moment because he made the best negotiation in, in football ever, I think, in Spain. For a club that this is a humble club, he, go, he went to banks to advance the money for TV rights for different uh, the, the years. First, he signed long-term contract with TV operators, okay, because they, they promote from the third to the second, from the second to the first, and suddenly, in a few years, they had the chance to win La Liga with that famous penalty miss by Jukic, Jukic. Uh, in the last round of, of La Liga. No? And that was a point that everybody knew who was Deportivo La Coruña, because that was something uh, historic. And then Lendoiro took advantage of this uh, big moment of uh, Deportivo La Coruña to sign good contract with TV rights long term and went to bank to say, okay, advance me five years in advance. And with the money of five years, he spent it very well because he was one president that this is not usual, but he was one that he knew about football very ah. well. Very good decisions in terms of football. He was a president also like a sport or a sporting director. Wow. By, especially by choosing players to, to sign. And then with the money, he could shorten a little bit the gap between the two big clubs, Real Madrid, Barcelona, that all, they always have more money than anyone. In Spain, we have this. And uh, he bought very good players, young players, especially talented players. He focused in uh, under-21 national teams, Europe good teams, and he brought, uh, for example, Roy Mackay, very good friend. Under-21 with Holland, he brought me from uh, from Racing de Santander, but they were in the under-21 national team, Spain national team. Another couple, Cesar, uh, I remember, uh, he brought all, young talent. Cap de Villa eventually. The following year, but it, it was a scaling, no? Scaling. He, he mixed very well between talent players, quality players, spending the money, also paying transfers. That was something unusual for, for a, a, a very humble club to have the capacity to pay a transfer for good players. For international players, it's, it's, nowadays, this, this is not possible. No. You can imagine that. And also, experienced players, good players that they had, because they had the Brazilians, Mauro Silva, uh, okay, I didn't play with Bebeto, Rivaldo, because they lived before, but they had Mauro Silva, they had Donato, they had Flavio Conceição, they had Yalmiña. So, we had very good squad, thanks to the president decisions. And later, of course, we have to give the credit to the, the coach, the way he was training, Irureta, and they, they, they did the perfect mix to succeed in that environment. What was it, it, most people won't remember Irureta as yeah. an Atletico Madrid midfielder. Yeah. So he was a very successful footballer. He won top the title. quality, top Claro. Top quality player, top yeah. quality player. But I told you before, football is so quick. 
So what happened today happens yeah, and then bye, bye. You can imagine, you look uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, pff, the new generations, they don't focus but back, they this, focus so on the present. This is a small window of opportunity to try to explain a little bit about his personality yeah. and his ideas. One of the things I remember all the time was that Diego Tristan was one of the exceptional strikers playing there. And Diego Tristan um, loved to go to the casino in the hotel. And Roretta was living in the hotel. Yeah. So every night before he went to bed, he would go down to have a little look to kick Tristan out of the casino. Well, it's, it's, it's not 100% like that, but it's close. It's close. I explained to you. Okay. I reached Deportivo La Coruña and first season we won La Liga. That's amazing. It's, it's a miracle. That's amazing. Amazing. And uh, uh, with this mix of, of experienced players and new young talent players. Uh, the following season, Lendoiro continued bringing good players like Diego Tristan, Cadevila, Valerón, uh, Molina. He took advantage of Atlético de Madrid relegation to the second division to, to choose players from them and bring to Deportivo de La Coruña that these uh, three players. Capdevila, who, who will become a World Cup winner. Yeah, Molina, Molina, who is now the director of football for the Federation. Yeah, and Valerón, maybe, in my opinion, uh, one golden ball miss for Spanish football. Fantastic. If he had played in Real Madrid or Barça, for sure he would have the chance with the focus that they, these big clubs they provide to you in, and the marketing around them, because he had the talent. The football he had, he had uh, amazing. A talent. Spanish Zidane. Yeah, yeah. I, okay, Zidane is uh, amazing also. But for me, Zidane had the chance to play in a big club, like a, like Juve that was like a trampoline. No, I don't know if you say trampoline. Yeah. It's trampoline for him to yeah. go upwards in your yeah. life. In your Valero, career. he didn't have this chance because okay, he stayed, he reached Deportivo La Coruña, and there. He outstand and, and Lendoiro had the capacity also to, to remain the talent. That, that was something that you have to give the, the merit to the president because normally in the, in the humble teams, when there is a talent that succeeds, the big clubs, they came to, to win. And you take the money. Okay, for, he, at the end you can stop that because Bayern Munich did with Roy Mackay. But after winning La Liga, winning the Spanish Cup, semi-final Champions League, so... Um, after a good period of succeed, no? and, and with options, because we had Rimakai, Pauleta, uh, Diego Tristan, Luque, okay. Bandiani, such a five strikers we had at that time. So, in terms of uh, Irureta, you said, of course, he, he did a great job. And why they didn't give so credit and we don't listen to speak a lot about what he did? Pues, I think it is because. Nowadays, business is business, and the news are built for the big audience. And big audience are big clubs. So what you do in a small club, okay, is very good. You have your moment, but pat on the head and off you go. This is this amazing job is not going to sell the same that another job from big clubs that is doing later and has more more audience. I I think it's that it's a matter of of business, but what he did was amazing for sure. And, and I, I tell you, uh, when I became coach, I understood a lot of things that I didn't understand during my times as player with Irureta. We, in that dressing room, we had big talent, big hunger, all the players, the experienced ones and the young ones, we were hungry of succeed, that that was very, very important. But we were complaining about the method of training that we had because it was exactly every day the same. So I was seven years in, in Deportivo La Coruña contract, six, the six ones, the six first with Irureta, and we did this, all the Mondays the same, all the Tuesdays the same, all the Wednesdays <laughs> the same, like this during six years. So you can imagine with the mental, players' mentality that I told you before that we complain for everything, how was our concern? It's Every boring. Here it's we go boring. again. This is something that as an, as a, in the new methodology of coaching, they touch to the new coaches. It's very important the, to, to choose uh, trainings, change the, the drills, change the... Because the, if you do always the same, uh, the players get in a boring mood and then this is wrong to get the high performance, you don't improve. And like that, no? So, uh, it, but it comes from that days 
that were the players were, were complaining about the methods. But I have to tell you, I have to be honest, and I recognize that that method helped us a lot, a lot. It was boring, okay, but not so much. Habits? Habits and expertise. When you do many times one thing, you get an expert, you get a master. So our trainings, were, we were repeating the things, but we were being master and master and master. So that's why that Deportivo La Coruña performing in such a high level that we were standing for many years during all the, this generation of very good players we had. But not only in Spain facing the big clubs like Barca and, and Real Madrid. We won La Liga first year, but we were second, we were third. But also we went to Europe and we won in every big stadium Europe of Europe, every big stadium. So I, I look the at, method was success. I, I look at your record um, against the big teams, like for example um, against Arsenal, um, against Juventus. Played six, won three, drew three, no yeah. defeats. Deportivo La Coruña yeah. against Juventus. Um, you could, I mean, I could go on, but I, I highlighted things like Arsenal, Bayern Munich, Manchester United. I play at Highbury. I remember that day, that amazing, what a beautiful stadium. Which, when you, when you won 2 0? Yeah. So, also, against. Also, when, when we lost with an amazing. 5 1, but we don't need the, to talk about that. The Invincibles. <laughs> the Invincibles were fantastic. Yeah. But, uh, but we beat them, eh? You played four, also one, we beat them. one three, lost one yeah. against Arsenal. And genuinely, the list goes on, um, whether it's uh, yeah, we Manchester all, United, played yeah. five, won two, lost three. Yeah, but we won at Old Trafford, uh, we won at Highbury, we won at uh, uh, the, uh, the Prince Park against uh, PSG, we won at Turin, we won at Milan, we won at Munich against Bayer Olympic Stadium. No one team in Spain in, in the entire history was able to win at the Olympic Stadium against Bayern in Munich. We did with Deportivo. Later, years later, Real Madrid won, but not in the Olympic Stadium, in the new one. I need to ask you then, because I, 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 don't, I hope you don't consider it self-indulgent to always be talking about your triumphs, because football is about learning and losing and learning how to cope with that. But Triumphs are interesting. Triumphs are inspirational yeah. for those people. A lot of the people we're speaking to don't live in the football world, which we have the great fortune to do. I, I Vicariously, I can watch, I can listen, learn. They have to go to, they're listening to this. Hello, everybody. They're going to work, going, fuck, I'm going to work again. Or they're walking the dog, or they're in the gym, or I don't know where. And they get endorphins listening to you. So I don't want to skip the centenary victory in, in, in Bernabeu which must have been an extraordinary feeling and it was a big achievement. But is there a link, I think there's a link, between what you talked about in Amsterdam, when you looked across the corridor at Juventus, to the day in the Riosor in the Champions League when AC Milan, the reigning champions of Europe, come. I was in San Siro two weeks before. It's a 4-1 win. The result, uh, I'm going to use a Spanish word, they use en engañar, engañoso, a result which lied, yeah. because in San Siro, Deportivo La Coruña were magnificent, led 1-0. There was an explosion of Kaká and Shevchenko, and suddenly, it's 4-1. Yeah. A, a completely scandalous misrepresentation of the 90 minutes. But there's a relationship between Real Madrid Juventus in 98 in Amsterdam, and Deportivo La Coruña, and AC Milan of Seedorf, and Gattuso, and Ancelotti the coach, and I don't know how many superstars in the pasillo, in the corridor, in the rear sort, it has to be. Yeah, yeah, not in the corridor that time, but, for, uh, but totally agree. That was while we were warming up at the, at the pitch, that moment. You know, we were a, 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 funny, a, funny, a funny group, a French group in Deportivo La Coruña. I mean, um, Despite we were complaining about the, uh, the method of training, no? boring, no? We, we, we got used how to enjoy it. And how? By very good relationship between players, so we made funny things during trainings. Okay, we were doing the drills, the tasks, 
and always the same, but we found the way to enjoy it. So that uh, makes also that the, the players we connect a lot as a friends, not only as a, as a professional teammates. And when, when we faced the second leg game against Milan, that moment after losing 4-1 in, in, in San Siro, I remember uh, we realized after the speech in, before the game that we were something very difficult to do. Okay, they were the currently Champions League winners, 4-1 in San Siro. The most of the people they think is done. Nobody pays something for us, paying nothing. Nobody. Okay, let's try. I remember the speech. Let's organize, let's set one target. At least winning the game to say goodbye to the competition, but in a positive way to our fans and like that. That was the message from Irureta. This is Irureta. Irureta. That was the message from Irureta. Let's try to win the game. And he knew us. I'm 100% sure that he knew that because during all the, all, all the years, season by season, we had many argues with him. Different players, uh, character players we had, hunger players, talent players, we wanted to succeed, we wanted more and more winning mentality. And we faced to him many times, we have to change this, and uh, discussions with the, with the coach. Oh, in the, the, the half times, many times. He knew how to deal with these character players, sometimes by doing nothing and leaving us alone, sometimes by saying, hey, you have to do what I said. And I, I, I realized many years later that he said that words to spoil us. To make you angry. Yeah. Sure, definitely. We'll, we'll, sure, because you we'll know, look. that was the point where we were in the meeting room, like, eh, like hundreds of meetings with him, many players like that. <laughs> you know, because it's the same, it's the same, and uh, after uh, the, the lunch, uh, you ha we have the meeting, someone is uh, sleeping away, <laughs> still uh, sleeping, sorry. <laughs> and he said that, and, uh, and I said, have you listened to that? He, he knew that uh, by spoiling us in this way, the challenge does, uh, he's saying uh, we are going to win just to say goodbye to the competition in a positive way. Come on. He, he, wo he knew what kind of player he had. And then when we went to the, to the warm-up, all the players we start to say, hey, have you seen what I said the coach? Come on, we can do. Why not? It's something historic, but it's not so difficult. We scored one in the first minute. Then we score another near to the half time. And then we are just one to overcome in all the second half. So let's go for the first. And during one up, we change into the Warriors mood. Thanks also to the speech. And of course, thanks to the scenario, to the possibility, to the opportunity to do something great. Because that's something that was a motivation for that, that squad. And we did. You were playing Dida Cafu. I, I don't know if anybody remembers these names. Dida Cafu, Paolo Maldini, Alessandro Nesta, Pancaro, Gattuso, Sedorf, Pirlo. Did he make it as a... Did, did he have a good book out in English? Our, our, our colleague published the book, uh, the autobiography of Pirlo in English. Kaká, Shevchenko, John Dal Thomason, and the substitutes, Inzaghi, Serginio, Rui Costa, and manager Ancelotti. A goal from El Rifle, the, the lorry driver, Walter Pandiani, after five minutes. But being there, the stadium was shaking. The noise was incredible. And I remember looking at Milan players, looking around, going, literally, for all their experience, and they're also hungry hard, they weren't fit enough. They were looking around going, what the fuck is happening? As, as the poor players zoomed past them, pressed them, robbed them. It, it, was, it was a hurricane. It was, it was like, like Haaland nowadays. It <laughs> was like Haaland nowadays. We, we performed like Haaland. The, the, every single <laughs> Deportivo La Coruña players, we, we outstand in that day. I, I, I want to show you with you one funny thing the previous night to the game, because I'm a very good friend of Clarence Seedorf from our time at Real Madrid, and then when they came 
when they fly to... You, you say you're a good friend of him, but you robbed him of a Champions League and you robbed him of a Copa del Rey. But okay, we, we'll go on. Yeah, but we still have very good relationship. <laughs> yeah, this is, we understand. When this you, is football. When you have winning mentality, you respect the winners, of course. And, and I, I came to his hotel with my wife and my son because I want to introduce to my friend Clarence, my son, who was just born a few, few months or, or just about one year, I think. And, uh, and we were talking about the game, for sure. And I, I saw him so relaxed. So, okay, you have to tell me one good restaurant for tomorrow to eat seafood because I know here in La Coruña is the best seafood in the world. Yes, it is, for sure. And uh, we have to prepare something after the game to celebrate. We are going to be to the semi-final. And I said to him, hey, Clarence, yeah, you are sure? <laughs> Stop, eh? Calm, because here in, the, in La Coruña, there is uh, something that all the, the old people, they say that uh, there are uh, witches, no? I think, San, no, brujas. Brujas, witches? Say. So it's very famous, Galicia, no, for, for that. And I said, uh, in our stadium, there is this kind of magic environment that uh, something is finished yet, eh? be careful. And, and when the game ends, he was so angry, hey, we couldn't, we couldn't <laughs> talk anything. <laughs> I understand also, it's a very, diff it's a very difficult moment, you are very dis disappointed and, and also you need your time, like we talk later. Uh, and he told me, you told me in advance about that, what you did, come on, you killed us, come on. And I remember also many, many years later, talking about Pirlo, in his memories, he, in a book he, he wrote, he, he suggested something about the players that I, I, I have to ask, please respect, because as a, as a professional, we cannot say this about uh, partners. Stupid words it's in very anger. Stupid in words. anger. Very stupid words, because um, he suggested that we took something. First of all, I don't trust that by taking anything in football, you can get success, because it's a very complex game. Very complex game. So, first, first of all, second one, for sure, what we took was the vitamins from our coach in the speech that he spoiled us and the winning mentality he had that was the point what happened that when the referee whistled the half time we were leading 3-0 so the, the the job was done at the half time we were winning 3-0 so the players we ran sprinting to the dressing room because we didn't want to stop so when you are doing this you don't feel the tiredness, you don't feel nothing because you are in, in, in an uh, adrenaline mood, so, you feel so strong, so important what you are doing, that you don't feel any tiredness. And we were running sprinting to the dressing room, nobody sit. I remember that half time. Nobody sat Nobody down. sat down. <laughs> nobody sat down. And the coach tried to say, okay, come and get some instructions. And everybody was saying, continue, continue, we have to continue. It's nil-nil, nil-nil game. We have to continue. We have to win the second half. Come on. This is something for us. We're not going to lose this now. So everybody was in this mood, Warriors mood. So we, but thanks to the coach, I say. Thanks to the coach. And then we came to the second half and also we won once. You, you, made, a nice, so we did you made a nice zero. assist for the fourth goal yeah, for Fran. I remember. And I was also close to a score during the first half. In the first, we were pushing. So it was an amazing game. We performed all the players in our best. For, for what time. And please, uh, respect for this uh, humble club, humble city, humble fans, that they are amazing. I, I swear to you, it was... I, I, I've all the credit, all the credit, no, no... It's in my... No, top, nothing has to be missed. Top five memories yeah. in my entire working career. We have socios, Victor. Chris Hennigan, this is a quick uh, question answer. Chris Hennigan, the socios have been with us for seven years, supporting us all the time. Chris Hennigan says, Wow, Victor Sanchez de Lamo, what an absolute treat. I'd be fascinated to know whether it was always going to be one or other between Jalminho or Jalminha or Valeron at Depor, or was there ever a real strong effort by the management team to get these extraordinary players to play in tandem together following Juan Carlos's arrival? It's, it's, uh, look, for me it has been a pleasure have the both as a, as a partner. It's, it's been amazing sharing with them uh, not only games, 
the trainings. What I have seen uh, from Jalminia side during trainings, I have to tell you, and I have to tell to, to our friend, Chris, Chris, that I've never seen in a football game. Wow. So um, I can explain you. One drill that we were used to do with Irureta was a crossing exercise. No? So the, the wingers, we were crossing, crossing and crossing and crossing to, to develop and to, to improve always our ability of crossing. And the forwards and number nines or number tens uh, or uh, midfielders reaching from the second line, box to box midfielders, they were heading, no? heading or kicking. The idea from Irureta was to head. But, for example, uh, Makai, he didn't like to head. <laughs> he was always volley. <laughs> and Irureta was always like, hit with the head. And Irureta said, yes, yes, hit with the head, but I volley to the top corner. <laughs> always. So it's amazing. But later, without practicing, during games, I cross and Makai head to the top corner also. And he came to me during the celebration to say, look, I don't practice, but I put with the head in the top corner. Do you understand? I don't need that. So that was the environment I had nice. also, and the, the special uh, chemical connection with our coach. And about Jarmina, he was able to head facing the, his own goal. So you can imagine we were crossing, and he turned during the ball was in there, and hitting the, the ball with his head, but with the back part, and scoring. So I, when we were watching doing this, nah, this is a lucky situation. But he did and repeat and repeat. So he's an amazing talent. And it was a pity that they, the both at the same time, they concede in, in the same team to play in the same position. It's a pity because at the end the coach had to choose one and he chose most times uh, Valeron. Because Valeron didn't Valeron give him was, a didn't give him a cabezazo like Jalminia no, no, did. No, it was more, more regular, more consistent performance. Jalminia sometimes he was uh, missing during the games, but when there was a big game, for sure you have to put Jalminia because he was uh, a magician. One more socio, Tim Lee. Tim says this is a little bit off the central theme of the conversation, but I'd love to hear, Victor, you played. Uh, classicals, you played Madrid Atletico, you played uh, the Galician derby, you scored a hat trick in one of the Galician derbies, yeah. the Depor against Santa Vigo, but you also played uh, in the big Panathinaikos Olympiakos derby. <sighs> Again, it's however much we say this derby, this classical, Manchester United Liverpool, yeah. only if you've lived that experience can yeah. you begin to yeah. understand how... And that was uh, for really something new for me and, and very special. I, I have very good memories from my times at Greece, first as a player in Panathinaikos and later two times as a coach, as assistant coach first time in Olympiakos and later as head coach. I made my debut as a coach in Champions League with Olympiakos, so very good memories. But uh, as a player, I remember that game that derby against uh, Olympiacos, and, and you know, at that time, Olympiacos was far away from the others, so uh, that was our game, no? our title. If we, if we won Olympiacos at that game, that was like our title, it was like that. I, uh, we won 1-0, I, I did the goal, and I finished the game like Toreros, you know, eh? Bullfighters, when they finish a great uh, afternoon, the, the fans come and they jump you on, the, on your shoulders, like that. In the game, and and what was funny is that we were leading the game one zero, and in, during the last minutes they were pushing, 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 and there was a, a corner for us, and in the corner there was a big counter, and and they ran so quick, and I I kick the one with the ball because I I realized that I had to do the the fold instead of uh, they had the chance very clear to to draw and I was sent off. The first time in my career, I was sent off, and the only one. And all the fans start to applaud that action. So that's so... One also, of the best decisions yeah, you ever yeah, made. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the, no, okay, the dirtiest uh, play that I did, but uh, that brings the higher performance. And the Pana fans will love you forever. Yeah, for sure. Victor, before we finish by, by, by talking about a coach's analysis, of how to treat the phenomenon Erling Haaland. I have to tell you something about uh, uh, Centenariazo. We cannot oh, miss. Oh, oh, what? Thank you, then, it's in a, that case. Because it's a the, lot of things. It's yeah. a hard, you know, it, yeah. the word I used to find difficult in Spanish uh, was desic 
equilibrante. But I can't say the word. Say it again. Centenariazo. 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 Yeah, it's, it's, even it's not easy for us. For Thank you. In Spanish. What, but what, I a, have, what a kind I, man this I, is. I, I have this problem with English, so I, uh, I beg your pardon about my no, English. So I try to... Tens of thousands of people right now saying, uh, no, Victor, your English is better than English people's English. <laughs> no, no. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate but uh, I, I study to improve always with this mentality. Look, in, the, in the UK, I began to look at Spanish football quite young, but we didn't have live Spanish football in the UK until the middle 90s, uh, until approximately 95, 96. Uh, and by the time that uh, Sky Television and Revista de la Liga was really popular, Along came, most people had the idea that, the, maybe the false idea, that Real Madrid kind of controlled Spanish football. So there was the idea in Britain that the fact that Madrid were going to turn 100 years old and they qualified for the cup final and the cup final was in the Bernabeu, everybody went. Everything was ready for the party, Thank for the God. white party. Everything. But but not but Deportivo La Coruña's players were not ready for the like, Real Madrid party. Like Juventus de Turin chosen the wrong opponent in the right mo in the wrong moment. Real Madrid wrong uh, cho chosen the wrong opponent in the wrong moment. What, what, was, the La Coruña. what was the experience? What was it? Was it a, a, a tactical, athletic, or mental triumph uh, that day? It's, it's a. It's a is the sum of uh, all, is the addition of all these things. In, in, when you have to face uh, this big achievement or this, this big challenge first, you need to compete in a high level in all the things. We were a humble team. That's why I wanted to talk about that because uh, we have to give all the credit to what we did with Deportivo La Coruña. 250,000 uh, small city at the north of Spain, uh, a club that uh, 15, 10, 10, 15 years ago they were in the third division of Spain. That the third division in the Spain is the fourth because uh, the, the name first division, second division, second B and third. So it was uh, actually the fourth. So we had the players with the talent, with the mentality, we had the coach, we had the method, we had the formation, the foundations, and the motivation. That was very important. That thing was always hunger to, to achieve important things. And playing a final against Real Madrid in Bernabeu, is there anything, something more difficult in football? Because uh, now we have to remember that Real Madrid has won 14 times Champions League and has been in 17 finals. So they had won 14 of 17. That's amazing. That's why also Real Madrid has won, for their own merits, this category of the best team in finals. If you play a final against Real Madrid, you are dead. This is something that is, is, is in the football language uh, abroad. Then we came, the, the Galicians guys, so, and before starting the game happened something also. When we, you know, when the players, we come to the pitch to check how it's the grass, etc. No, before coming to the dressing room and, and change ourselves, we, we meet there with some Real Madrid players also. And, and you know that uh, in Real Madrid they had Flavio Conceição, that was our teammate the previous season. So he, they bought, Real Madrid bought Flavio Conceição from, from Deportivo La Coruña. We were friends. And he told us, I, I remember because I, got, I was in the middle of that, speech. We were near to the half pitch. We were Mauro Silva, Jalminha, Valeron, uh, I don't remember more, and, and Flavio came to us. Oh, hello, how are you guys? How are you? Yeah, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, good night. Oh, yeah. well, what amazing stadium. How are you? The, the, the typical things. And Flavio asked, uh, very similar than what Sedorf asked to me before the, the comeback in Champions League. <laughs> Okay, we have everything ready for the for after the dinner. We have the also one place for for go to celebrate. It, join us, guys! Join us, and we are going to the party. And and, and I saw I, I, at that moment the Jalminha face, and, and I understood everything. <laughs> and when we came into the dressing room, we were coming for the corridor, and and I said to Jalminha. Have you listened? They, they, they are preparing the party and they are inviting us to the party. 
Let's do. <laughs> and again, again, we play as a unit. So how we commit with the, that game was amazing. We we did it was a two one the, the result, but I think we deserve more. We deserve more, and it was a very tough game because that was Galacticos Real Madrid. So it's not a, not a single Real Madrid. Um, they, they go on that season to win the Champions League yeah. at Hamden against Leverkusen. For those who don't remember, Cesar Sanchez, Salgado, Roberto Carlos, Iero, your old teammate, Ilguera, Pavon, okay, Zidane, Luis Figo, Claude Macalelli, Raul Morientes, Manaman Guti and Solari came on, Da Bosque is the coach. It's a big achievement. Football has taught all of us, even before this interview, that just because you've got 11 great names doesn't mean you win. But that was a Madrid site that was built to conquer everything. I wonder if there was some complacency on their autocomplacencia that they also believed, as well as making arrangements. I don't think so. The Real, Real, 14 Champions League wins in, of 17 finals. The complacency in mood in Real Madrid is not in the finals. It's in games like the other day against... Uh, Mallorca. Against Mallorca or uh, against Osasuna. Last the season day. against Sheriff. Yeah, against Sheriff. This is the typical complacency match day. But finals are made for Real Madrid mentality. You know what happened? That they underestimate us and for sure we surprised them. And, and, we, and we had a really, really good team with individuals but also working as a team. I remember something very funny also, but I, I, in my past, is, in my heart is Real Madrid for sure. But I was, I was touching Real Madrid in the winning mentality, and that means that when you have to play something, you have to win. You win. So, I mean, you have to play against Real Madrid, you have to win. And this is what, what we did. But my, my father-in-law is Real Madrid fan, 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 fan. And he was at the stands. He was at the stands with my tickets, and my tickets were Deportivo de la Coruña fan mm. zone. So you can imagine, there was a third of the stadium, Deportivo de la Coruña, and two thirds, Real Madrid. No, everybody waiting, the big celebration. But, while we were winning the game from the beginning, 0-1, 0-2, and 1-2. So the, the Galician side, they were, uh, there was one moment during the second half that they start singing happy birthday to you to, to Real Madrid fans. <laughs> and I, re I remember that moment. So that's why coming back now to the emotional situations, this is certainly an emotional situation that has made an impact in my mind uh, as a memory, because I always was focused, focused, focused in the game. I didn't realize what happened in outside, but at that moment I remember because so, what's so funny and say, oh come on, what are they doing? <laughs> and, and, and also I was thinking, hey come on, this is Real Madrid Templo. This is a, 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 a little bit of respect. And you, but, okay. And my, my father-in-law at the end of the game, he came to me and said, oh, I'm very happy. I'm very happy. Congratulations. I'm very happy. But I have to tell you something. What, what these fans have done in my stadium, <laughs> I don't accept. <laughs> so what's something, uh, some funny memories that... He's a generous do. man, but I, I see if, but you were the only madrileño in the team. Molino from uh, Valencia, there were players from Oviedo, from Catalonia, there were Brazilians, it was in Argentina, but you were the only madrileño coming to spoil the party in, in your own house as well. Yeah. An odd day, but a great day. Another winner's medal for you. And I, I remember in the moment that they give us the trophy, because they give a small trophy, uh, is the king of Spain. That, that day he uh, was the king and also he was the, the prince. And I was so happy at that moment when I received the trophy, I didn't give my hand, they didn't say my hand <laughs> with the currently king that was uh, at that moment the... Thanks, the Prince. Yeah, I, I took my cap and I, I continue just at that moment. Just I wanted to enjoy, we, to enjoy. It's a moment to enjoy with the with your fans. We all understand. <clears throat> in in a short time, one of the difficulties as we as we finish as we wind up now is that we don't know the teams which will start in the Classical. We don't know if Courtois will mend his sciatica, <laughs> what form Benzema will be in. Probably Kunde doesn't make it, but. In, in speaking about the classical, where you played many times, winning, losing, it's back at the Bernabeu where you won the, the Centenary Cup final. Um, and it's in this strange season where the classical will kind of be like a punctuation point before the World Cup. There are some games afterwards, but this will be our, our big occasion in Spanish and maybe European football 
before the World Cup begins. And you know about the <laughs> things that tactically um, Madrid can do, but also psychologically, because for many years now, for the, I don't know if it was the same in your time, for many years now, Barca win at Bernabeu, Madrid win at Camp Nou, mm -hmm. in an incredible seesaw pattern. Yeah. Let's look at Madrid. What are the things that they must do, mentality, strategically, to win this Clásico? And how much importance, so early in the season, do you place upon this Clásico? Well, I think that uh, we have the, uh, the reference that the Clásico at Bernabéu last season, where Real Madrid uh, arrived as leader of uh, La Liga, and, and without a big gap to the second, and Barcelona struggling, uh, not in a, in a, not even no, in a very difficult situation, no, and and Barça outstand, and, and they won, I, if I remember, four zero, no, was, and could could be more for Real Madrid. I think that Real they they had a lack of two things that the, that uh, game that this season they don't have this problem. So. I mean, one, a lack of fitness condition in terms of speed. The uh, midfield of Real Madrid when they played against big clubs uh, in the big games was affected in, in this time. Casemiro, Modric and Kroos, they are really good players. Casemiro, very intelligent player, tactical player, but he's not very quick. Kroos is an amazing quality player, tactical player, clever player, but he's not very quick. And Modric, he has good speed, of course he, he has everything, but also at his age, he has not the capacity to do a lot of, to repeat efforts, no? one and another and another. So when you face big games, the fitness condition come to, to play a big part of the games. It's not only a matter of quality or tactics, also you need a, a very good fitness conditions. And in football you need speed, you need strength, and you need endurance. So, if you have a lack at any of these three, you have a problem. Because big clubs, when you compete for titles in La Liga or in Europe, the big clubs, the teams that they provide higher performance, they have this power. And Real Madrid had this. So, uh, in my opinion, Barça outstand Real Madrid thanks to they were weaker players than Real and better organized than Real because the lack of speed and the lack of strength in this position make a Real Madrid unbalanced team, especially when they try to, uh, to press in a high way. They played quite a high line. They, the, the back line, they stay so back, so they create a lot of spaces between defensive line, midfields and forwards. This is perfect for a team that is used to build up from, uh, from the playing out from the back, passing, keeping possession, quality players and moving the ball side to side, finding the pockets, etc. like Barca is. So perfect game for Barca in the time that there was Real Madrid last season. Now, with the sign of Chouameni and uh, also with the improvement of Camavinga and also with Valverde improvement and the step that the, all this young generation has made uh, forward, like Vinicius, Rodrigo, Repeat Valverde, Camavinga, Chouameni is a, is a high, uh, high level in fitness condition. So Real Madrid now, they don't have this gap. So Chouameni, Kroos, Modric, I don't think they are going to play together because um, it's going to be Chouameni, Modric and another one, powerful. So that provides more uh, compact uh, abilities to Real Madrid, more consistent in the, in, the, in the transitions, because the transitions are a very important moment during the games. So you try to organize your attack, you try to organize your defense when you have time, no? but the moment where you don't have time is the transition. When you lose the ball, you have to quick react to try to recover or to reorganize. These are the big moments. You need the fitness condition there, and that's so important. Is an example of what you're arguing, the previous class court can now where Barcelona are already losing, are pressing very high, they're on the edge of Madrid's penalty box, I think from a set play, from a corner. Yeah. Alaba wins the ball, starts on a run, Barca can't keep up, the ball goes to Vinicius, Alaba's continued the run, the ball goes wide, I think, to Rodrigo. 
into yeah. Alabama. So th th that, these types of transitions where a single error of position or control, maybe 12, 13 seconds later, yeah. four passes can lead to a goal. Yeah. That's the type of mm, preparation and ability you must yeah. have to turn a classical. Yes, you know, Barca style of playing is very clear. So uh, for me as a coach, when you play against a team that they play always the same, this is something good because through the analysis you know they are not going to surprise you anything because they are going to do the same. So that lets you the opportunity to prepare something in terms of tactic or strategy to, to block their strengths and to try to explode their weaknesses that all the things they have. So uh, Real, to play against these kind of things, playing out from the back, uh, they, they risk a lot with uh, passes near to the goalkeeper and many players playing with the back, trying to play one-two, that also see if you organize very well the press, you can recover many balls and you, are very, you can be very uh, quick in, in the opponent's goal. So that needs organization, so that needs to be trained, a plan, a tactic plan, but also that needs uh, the fitness condition. So when you go to press high in a, in, a, in a high position with players like Kroos, like Modric, like Vinicius, that he has the fitness condition but he is not well organized player. He needs to understand better, reading better the, the game, to take better decisions because many times he runs everywhere but without a good sense. So just one player with a lack of fitness and you are dead against these quality teams playing for them. They only need one, one lack, one player, because that's what they play. They try to make the numerical, numerical superiority with the, through the goalkeeper involved in the, in the foot play to try to bring the pressure and then you, you put one player, you, one opponent out and you have the numerical advantage to go for the spaces because also the team that go to press high, they have the spaces. Now Real Madrid is a much, much better team in terms of organization and fitness, so they have better capacity. And also Real Madrid has this possibility to go to press high, but also have the possibility to run back. Mm -hmm. that, that was also another problem. When you have this lack of speed in, in midfield players, what happens? You never, you, you don't succeed 100% of times you go to, for the high pressing. The other team many times, uh, sometimes or many times, depending on the day or depending on the quality, overcomes you through quality passes or through long passes, and you have to run back. If you are a slow running back, you have problems. But now Real Madrid, again, has reduced these weaknesses because they have quick players, not only in the back four line, also in the midfield, that it is, this is very important. And in, from the opposite side, uh, uh, it's in a very mature moment, Real Madrid. So they have improved, in my opinion, their, their basis for defending in terms of pressing or in terms of, of waiting back. Thanks to the organization, one year more working with the same coach provides better organization. Young players that they need more time, they learn more. And then we are watching this Real Madrid with young players performing in a higher level than previous season. That this is also very important and provide to the coach much more options in all the lines. That was a lack that they had last season. So more mature moment for Real Madrid defending and also in offensive they had. They had the quality, we see Real Madrid also not only everything that they is very good running to the counter because the speed of the, of the wingers like Rodrigo or Vinicius, the quality Benzema playing between lines and assisting their other teams, the quality, the midfield, Modric, eh, Cross, etc. Not only that, also they play out from the back mm -hmm. in a very quality level. We have seen performing in a, a, and scoring goals. For example, in Champions League decision against Celtic, I, I don't know if it were after 22 or 32 touches playing out from the goalkeeper. No, so, uh, I mean, in the goal that Hazard yeah, scores eventually. It's used to say that Real Madrid wins anyway, but in a despective way. No, Real Madrid wins, wins games in any way because they know how to play in any way. That this is something that this has a strength because during a game happen many things. Okay, in advance you try to happen what you prefer, but the opponents, they do the same. So you have so, to adapt. Yes, you have to adapt during the game and there are moments, for me the moments are the most important. The, the formations are not the most important thing in football. We give a lot of uh, uh, highlights to, okay, 1-4-4-2, 1-3-3, whatever. No, the moment. 
-hmm. where, where you are and what you do. This is the most important for me. And reading the game is the most important situation you have to do for performance. It doesn't matter if you play a back line of four or five, depends where you are, where you are in the pitch. Because with uh, three, uh, three at the back, you can be very defensive or you can be very offensive, depending where you put them. You put them defending in your own box, okay, you are very defensive. You put them in the half line, you are very offensive. But if you want to take this risk, you need three, three center backs very quick, because sometimes the other team, not sometimes, the other team is going to run to your back. So this is the, the richness of football, that always there is something you do, there is always a reaction from their opponents. Sometimes you organize through the coaches, sometimes the own players during the pitch, they take the decisions to do the things. So, I think um, to close on the classical, I think one thing that Xavi has tried to do in recent seasons is to control moments by placing Araujo in the 4-0 and the 1-0 in Las Vegas against Vinicius. To me, it's very sad just for the, the fun of analytically watching a centre-half, a Uruguayan, made to play as a right-back in order to go 1v1 against Vinicius and to decrease the number of moments that he can create. He's not going to be there. Mm -hmm. to, to what extent does that also change the balance towards, we hope Vinicius stays fit between now and the classical. Fingers crossed, let's assume that he does. His energy, his anarchic play, his link with Benzema now flourishes and, and offers so much more space and danger because Araujo is not there. Something that Xavi has believed is a really important tactic. This tilts the balance towards Madrid, right? No, of course, it opens a, a big uh, opportunity for Real Madrid uh, attacking through his left uh, wing. That is one of his strongest points with Vinicius as a left winger. Uh, if, the, if Barca, they don't have a good solution for the uh, one against one is going to be during the game. So this is a, a, in advance an advantage for Real Madrid, but let's see, because, for example, it's, it's not so simple. Of course, we uh, suppose that uh, the both teams are coming to the game with a full concentration, full motivation, so there is, gonna be, there is no space for a lack of attention, like, for example, Real Madrid, the other day they did against Osasuna, where we didn't see Vinicius performing in a high level. Of course, he also was dangerous, but very disorganized team they were. I wait a very well organized team from Real Madrid side against Barca and they have the option with Vinicius as a winger but Vinicius many times also come cut off the line coming in side position and opening the possibility for, for Mendy or for Benzema that also likes to make movements to the win or Rodrigo because also he likes to, to share the winger, Rodrigo again, he plays that we don't know the lineup. Maybe plays Rodrigo, maybe plays Valverde. Valverde. So let's see what happens. But what the most important is the occupation of the spaces and the the way you decide to attack. How? So if you need to move the ball quick, for sure this is very important because to attack you need to create spaces, to find spaces. Nowadays all the teams they have very good tactics in terms of defending, so you need to disorganize your team. How to disorganize your team? With your position, by positioning and by moving the ball. By moving the ball, you make the other teams unbalanced and then you have to take advantage of the spaces. This is the, the most important thing in football. So, as I said before, it doesn't matter the formation. The most important is where you are, the dispositioning and the moment. The moment depends on the time and the speed, the moment, okay, the right moment to change the pace, the right moment to move the ball, sometimes you need also to stop the ball to attract a player, but if you are very slow moving the ball, it's very easy for the other teams to defend. The best example again is the last game Real Madrid against Osasuna, and this is something that happened to Real Madrid oftenly. Barca is used to play the ball quick and to, play, to, move, the, to move the ball quick and also to dribble to bring players out of their position. This is something very uh, strong in their, in their philosophy, and they, they do. Real Madrid mix more, mix more, so it's more unpredictable. That is also a weapon for Real Madrid, because you, want, you try to, to advance what they are going to do, 
and it's not easy because I tell you, as a, as a coach, I faced Real Madrid and, and Barça several times. I have better stats against Barça than against Real Madrid because of that. They are unpredictable and you prepare the game, but finally they can, by individuals, Benzema, Rodrigo, Vinicius, Modric, and they kill the game. And, and you have done a good plan in terms of tactics, but they kill you through individuals. Other times they kill you also through tactics, so through organization. Barça, they have the two, the two things also, tactics and individuals. But the tactics, because always is the same, give you the chance to do something. You can anticipate it, maybe. Yeah. We, we, we close b because I, you, you talked about your stats against Barcelona. There, there was a a lovely performance in May 2015 when your Deportivo La Coruña side went 2-0 down at Camp Nou to, to a couple of Leno Messi goals and you had Fabricio and Canela and Sydney and Laure and Lopo Garcia and Bergantinos and Lucas Perez, Juan Dominguez, Celso Borges, Diogo Salamao, even Cavaliero. And Victor, possibly those 11 guys shouldn't have taken a 2-2 draw at the Camp Nou in, in that season where uh, Barca won the treble and had the trident up front of Neymar, Suarez and Messi. But when we were talking before this interview began, you, you've spent time analysing Erling Haaland, who's going to play for a city side, which is fantastic about their speed of movement of the ball, creating spaces, m unbalancing teams. And then you add in this guy who, at the moment in England, everybody is losing their shit about. He's the best ever, he's going to break every record. Those things are, are probably being said too soon and too loudly. But as a coach, analytically, what would you try to do if your team was playing Holland and City next week? And, and are there things you draw from your coaching success with Deportivo La Coruña at Camp Nou? Well, uh, football give to the coaches the, the opportunity to think. I think we have to think on football. So there are many, many options to play a game. And always in history, there are moments where big players makes the difference. And I, I got used as a coach working in Spanish La Liga to face best Leo Messi in history that they were making, he was making the difference in every game he played. So in Spain was every week, what are you going to every coach they were facing Barca, what are you going to do to stop Messi? What are you going to do to stop Messi? So we have seen a lot of things, a lot of the situations and at the end, the, the, the most usual was sitting all the team back, especially when you play at, at no camp and, and pray. <laughs> Pray for a bad day from Barca players, especially from Messi, and you have the luckiest day with one counter or one set piece. So this is the, I mean, when you coach uh, low ranch teams. I was coaching when I made my debut as a, as a head coach. I took my Deportivo La Coruña, my beloved Deportivo La Coruña, but we were the lowest budget in, in the competition, far away from, from my days as, as, a, as a player. So after golden days, they came also very difficult moments and that uh, created the opportunity for me for make my debut as a, as a coach at that moment. And I took the team eight, eight rounds to end the competition, struggling with the, with the relegation. So, and with a very difficult calendar because in the last at the games we had to face six of the top six teams in the table. At the last one, at no camp. Against Barca, that they were standing, but what nobody was taking in account that the, the, and I said to the, our players in the first day I, I took the team, that the most important work we did, I, I tell you, is the psychological work. Uh, I, I said something before about that, how important is for me the trust and the confidence in a team. Without trust and without confidence there is no performance, or there is no high performance. And we need, at that moment, we needed high performance to overcome the situation because we were about to relegate. So, nobody was taking into account that Barca could reach to the last game as champions without needing to win that game. That there was something, an opportunity, and a competitive opportunity we had for the calendar. It was very difficult calendar for us, but let's see what happened. For, so, the first target was to reach alive to the last round. And that's, that's happened. That's happened. Uh, Barca became champions in the, in the previous round. 
So, does mean that uh, that was going to be a very easy game? No, mm. for sure, because my experience as a player in Real Madrid gave me the, the same situation. When we became uh, La Liga champions with Fabio Capello, we did in the previous round till the end. And we had to play the last game in Vigo against Celta de Vigo that they were struggling with the relegation. And we play as champions. And they beat us 4-0. And I was playing that game, I remember perfectly, I had the, the feelings how we, we approached the, the, that game, wanted to win, but with a lack of mentality because we were end. Parties, celebrations, there was a big difference with Barca because for us, as Real Madrid players at that moment, the, the season was end. After that game, we were holidays. I, Capello was saying, ah, you are thinking in holidays. I remember the half-time speech. He was very angry because he didn't like to, to lose any game. Ah, you are thinking tickets, flight tickets for holidays. And we were, many players, they were with the luggage ready to go <laughs> after the game. But Barca, they became champions at that moment. But later they had to play Spanish Final Cup and one good later. Champions against League, Athletic. Against Athletic. And, and against and Champions, League, Champions League Final. So, that was the scenario that brings us the opportunity. Everybody was saying Deportivo is dead because they had to play against Barça. It doesn't matter Barça is champion because Barça, Messi, Neymar, all, all, the, all the players that they have, amazing, and also these players, they don't care about the championship is done because they want to score, to score, to score, to add more figures to their own stats and also for the Pichichi, so we, we, we had to face this. But, there was the last game for Xavi Hernández, currently coach of Barça, that day was the, the last game and they had prepared also a big party to say goodbye, thanks, and etc. And I remember when I, when I started working the previous week with my team, Deportivo La Coruña, this game, I said that, look, this scenario they are now provides us a big opportunity. I'm going to tell you what I think is going to happen. Barça, they are going to play 60 minutes in the around 60 minutes, minute 60, 60 something, they are gonna make the substitution with Xavi. So, big party, he will make the round to say goodbye to everyone, big celebration, and after this, the team has ended the game. No more effort, no more nothing, thinking in the final, in the cup, in the final cup, in the Champions League. But the first 60 minutes, they are gonna kill us for sure, because Messi wants to score, Neymar wants to score, etc. So, we have to reach a life to the 60 minutes. I asked for you to reach a life to the last match day. Now we are going to prepare the game with this idea. And what are, what are we going to do? Focus just in defending the first 60 minutes. Okay, we have a lack of, of quality in comparison with them, for sure. So, we organized the team in a 4-5-1, in a but very compact, very compact, to avoid to concede chances, clear the ball, no risk situations. And during the same week, we prepared this, but we prepared in the 60 minute, changing the formation to a 4-4-2, but in a, in a different, that's why I told you before, it doesn't matter the formation, it matter where you do the things and how. how you do. So, we move the team, 30 minutes from, I'm high pressing, 4-4-2, aggressive, taking risks, and that was the idea. So during the week we prepared these two things, but in advance, just defending, we don't want any risk till 60 minutes, and we have to reach that point with Xavi change alive, okay? If, if we uh, catch something in a corner or in a counter, perfect, let's see. But this is the, the main uh, task, okay. We were playing, we start the game, and it was going the game in this way. No chances, no chances against, we didn't concede, but Messi is Messi. Hmm. And in a free kick from 35 minutes, he put the ball in the top corner, okay. 1-0 to the dressing room. What happened? That everybody was, that way, they were watching the game, they were watching the Deportivo La Coruña without attacking. And you can imagine, radio, television, all the, what are they doing? They don't attack, they don't attack. Okay, they don't attack. They don't. And then, what happened? This is something that I have never told. It's, it's the first time. Uh, we came into the dressing room, one nil losing. And the things were running in our plan. So everybody was 
confidence, with trust, because that was the, the, the main concern during the week, to keep the mentality of the players trusting the plan. If you don't have the trust, it's, it's, you are dead. So we were. And suddenly the president came into the dressing room, crazy, shouting, what are you doing? You are not attacking. What do you want? You want to lose? What are you, you are not, what are you waiting to attack? Like that, like that. And I wait for a second thinking, Poof, come on, this guy is breaking my trust environment right now. What I do is the president also, what I have to do? And then I, ha I decide to ask. I wait for a while when he took a breath to continue shouting <laughs> and I said, this is my time. And I catch him and I say, president, okay, perfect, don't worry. And I, I put him and then put him away. Okay, let, let me, let me, don't worry. Boom. And I throw him from the dressing room. And then I came to the players and I said, okay, what is happening to the game? The concern was only the trust. The trust. What is happening? Is happening what you have said? Okay, Messi has a score, top corner. Oh, okay. How many chances did he create? And I asked to the players straight, to the goalkeeper, how many times? To the central defenders, to the midfielders. How do you feel? Is succeeding what we have done or not? How do you feel? You feel trust? You have, you have the game under control? Yes. Because normally Barca in the half time, they have shoot 12 times. They, they shoot a few times. So, I say, we keep with the plan. We are going to start warming up and in 15 minutes, we put again the two forwards and we move into a pressing high. What happened? We went to the second half and while we were doing the warm up, preparing the change, Barca scored the second. Again Messi. Again Messi. And I said to my assistant, come on, just when we were going to make the change, come on. And that was the point also when they did the change for Xavi. And Xavi makes the round, say goodbye to everyone. Also he, he came to me because we were partners at the national team uh, sometimes and he, he, he greets me also. I appreciate that, that moment in, in so important situation for him. And okay, we continue with the plan and we change. There were 25 minutes left, something about. And we scored two goals in, two, in, in 10 minutes. So in 10 minutes we were drawing and we need just one point to stay. And then we had to play the last 15 minutes <laughs> holding the result. But happened what we prepared. There was no, no same Barca than the first 60 minutes that they were pushing, pushing, pushing. They were okay after 60 minutes, after the goodbye of Xavi, with the two finals, we could hold the result for the last 10, 12 minutes and we did it. So it was, that was amazing day for that and, and very good memory. And, and, and I have never told before what happened in, in the dressing room. That moment. You made the right choice. Um, you stayed up. It's, it's a closing point to say that I was accurate in saying that one day you'd like to savour the atmosphere, um, the traditions of English football and coach in English football. That would be one of your objectives. Yeah, sure. I, I, I'm a big fan of, of English football. I love, I have travelled many times to, to England, to different cities. I have been visiting training centres. I, I, I am very lucky to have a, a very good friends uh, from other coaches and I have been there watching Pochettino at Tottenham training centre, I've been with Jokanovic at Fulham training centre, with Unai Emery at Arsenal training centre also, uh, visiting small, small stadiums also to, to understand, to learn, uh, sitting with the, with the fans, uh, it's, it's, it's very nice the, the atmosphere there is uh, in football in football stadiums. I remember as a player in Deportivo de la Coruña that uh, I, I always loved the Anfield environment. Uh, I think that this happened to, to many people that they like football, no? You'll never walk alone in the moment is, is something amazing. And, and while I was player, I was saying, hey, come on, I've been playing in Real Madrid Champions League, I've been playing in Deportivo La Coruña Champions League, and never faced Deportivo La Coruña. I'm not having the chance to go to Anfield and to listen live. You never walk alone. Come on, come on, come on. And finally, in our last season in Champions League, in the, in the group rounds, Deportivo La Coruña, Liverpool was in the, in the same group. So, it was one of my best memories also in football that moment listening at the beginning of the game the, the you'll never walk alone. So, uh, uh, I, and I had the chance, le years later, now as a coach, 
uh, during times that I, I have been without a job and I have traveled to England to learn, to see, because I love this, that uh, this environment is not uh, something that happened only in, in Anfield, at Anfield. Uh, many other stadiums happens the same. I've been in, in, in Seville, watching Seville Wednesday, for example, <laughs> amazing. I've been, but even at, at Brentford Stadium also in London, amazing. Uh, uh, West Ham with the with the uh, anthem that they have also is is amazing blowing bubbles blowing bubbles it's amazing I I like a lot and I'm trying to get my chance there but uh, it's not it's not easy it's w not easy you, during this interview you're you've shown an astonishing ability with English great vocabulary great accuracy in all that you've said. To be able to speak this well about playing and coaching in a foreign language is a massive achievement. You've shown that when somebody says to you, come coach our team in England, you'll be able to communicate as if English was your first language. You've mentioned warriors uh, uh, throughout the interview and, and our culture is a warrior culture. We treat every game not as a work of art or a piece of science. Every game in Britain is a war, always. So I hope very much indeed that you're ready for wars in England in the future. Anybody who wants to listen to Victor's brilliant analysis of football regularly, find La Liga on, on Premier in, in Britain and Ireland and regularly in La Liga studios. You'll listen to Victor previewing a game, analysing a game and like me, you'll be the more educated for it. Of all the interviews we've ever done, this has been by far one of the most Colourful, interesting, fun and educational. Victor Sanchez Delamo, muchísimas gracias. You're welcome, my pleasure.